Good. Let's go. Well, good morning, or good afternoon, I guess, at this point. It's a pleasure to be back in Hamburg. Uh, last year, we had a great show where we declared that we were bringing on a new many integrated core architecture to tackle some of the biggest problems on Earth. And today, we're going to make a second declaration. One, that we're on track to everything we said last year. And two, that we're off to go work with the industry to build computers that are a thousand times more capable than they are today with that architecture uh, going forward on the path to exascale computing. So the good news is, and certainly if you're a microprocessor supplier, the good news is that the supercomputers for the last several decades have required twice as much compute power as we've been able to deliver with Moore's Law, very consistently. They've had to build computers twice as big essentially each and every year in node count, uh, even with the phenomenal advancements we've made in Moore's Law. So if we look at things like uh, CT scans for cancer detection, uh, with a petaflop you know, of computing, it used to take about six minutes to get a result back. We're getting results now. If we get up to 10 petaflop, where a CT scan can get something back in a matter of 40 seconds, we want to get you know, CT scans down to a, the matter of you can get real-time information on the operating table. Uh, from that as we get out to multiple, multiple petascales of computing. If we look at things like genomic research, we want to go take hundreds of millions of atoms, be able to model an entire human cell as we get out to an excess scale of computing. And if that wasn't enough, if we go look at, and talk to companies that are to organizations like NASA, they're already looking at things that could take a million times the computing power to do full global uh, weather change. You know, it was back in 1985, I think, where you could only predict a hurricane two days in advance and where it was going to hit landfall 335 miles. Right? Almost two decades later, we can still only predict about two days in advance where a hurricane is going to hit within a 120 mile radius of land. So imagine if something's heading to your shoreline, how much of the population you need to evacuate. Right? We want to get to a place where we can predict you know, weeks and weeks in advance uh, global climates and, and where hurricanes are going to predict. So we can see a path for applications already today that could not just use a thousand times the computing power, but well into a zettaflop of computing. But that cannot be solved uh, using the technologies that are at today. And we'll talk about some of those challenges. So whether it's weather and climate, we're all exposed on a daily basis to global climate change and the discussions around that. Uh, we think exascale workloads will absolutely be involved in that to help make the world um, a better environment. With healthcare, you know, Intel wants to be foundational as we work to solve some of the toughest diseases and, and challenges on the planet and find a cure to AIDS and solve cancer and all those things we want to do around uh, the healthcare. You know, getting uh, drugs that are customized to your gene pool and your particular molecular makeup. I think it's, it's an interesting field. And then forms of energy, specifically here in Europe, looking at new energy sources and being able to tap what's already out there is, is another key area that we see. So we're going to talk about transformation. You know, whether it's cloud computing or HPC, Intel has fundamentally said that we need a new era of computing. You know, when we entered the server market in you know, roughly the late 90s, the average price of a computer, server computer, was $58,000. Today, it's less than $3,800. And on the path to exascale, we need to take another transformation on the cost curve on that. You know, when we hit 2000, the world said it had all the computers it needed because of the dot-com bust. And there was going to be a, a gray market and a black market of computers for years to come. And if you, if you haven't guessed what's happened since 2000, we've well more than double the amount of servers in the world. And in the meantime, Xeon has not just become a server processor, it's become a storage processor. And Intel now has said that we've gone from about 17% market share, ending last year at 70% market share, ending this year predicted at 80% market share of standard high volume storage. Whether it's direct attached storage, network attached storage, or SANS, Intel now is fundamentally trans helping transform the storage market and as a result, the cost of storage, uh, with our help and the help of obviously great innovation on the rest of the storage system, we've gone from $28,000 a terabyte 
to $1,700 a terabyte. And now we're looking at the next transformation in switching and routing with Xeon as the building block. But very simply, we think we can double the amount of servers in the world in five years versus the last 10 years as we look over the next uh, several years through 2015. Well, how did we do that? If you go back to supercomputing in 1997, keep in mind, we've done this in workstations. You know, today we have um, you know, nearly 100% share of the workstation market. But when I joined Intel, we were doing our microprocessor design on Spark <laughs> computers, right? Um, but I chose the supercomputing example because we're in a supercomputing show. So 1997, a teraflop of performance cost $55,000 a gigaflop. In 2010, you got more than 500 teraflops of performance for less than $100 a gigaflop. And this is for a petascale class supercomputer. I think you can go out and find projects out there that are less than $20 a gigaflop, or one-fifth of what we're showing here. So we've helped transform industries. To get to an exascale, we have to fundamentally change the cost of computing uh, once again. So today we're announcing our declaration that we will be a leader, if not the leader, in driving the world to exascale. And that's a huge commitment that's going to take not only Intel, but our industry partners that we have today, academia, and governments around the world to collaborate with us to accomplish this goal. We're trying to deliver over 100 times the performance of today, while only increasing power by 2x. And maybe the most important thing is not changing the software programming model. And taking all the benefit we've had of decades of multiprocessor and multi-threading research, Intel compiler technologies, et cetera, but scaling today's software model, not going and telling the whole world they have to go learn a new programming language to get there. So the three things we're committed to talk about today is efficient performance, delivering parallelism in the programming model, and driving to this extreme scalability. <coughs> so to talk about exascale requirements, um, let me uh, try to describe a, a fairly complex chart here. If you look at a petascale machine of 2010, and you look at what it takes to deliver a teraflop of computing within that petascale machine, Okay. We're basically talking about a five kilowatt node, um, or, or cell, if you will, to deliver a teraflop within that uh, petascale. What we're talking about as we go out to a, an exascale machine is a goal and a vision that we want to declare today of getting to a 20 megawatt machine. So just two times the power of what the largest machine is today, but at 100 times the performance. And that means you have to basically be able to deliver a teraflop of computing within 20 watts in that time frame. Okay? You also have to be able to deliver 40 times the compute, 75 times the memory, 20 times the COM, 33 times the disk and storage, and scale other things almost a thousand X. So these aren't things that we have all the answers for today, but that's what has really built Intel and a number of our partners is solving the world's toughest challenges, and that's what we're officially embarking on starting today. <laughs> on the programming model, um, we've shared this with you before, but we fundamentally believe, and we believe that the HPC community believes that um, the tools that Intel's put into the marketplace around the Intel architecture have served a great purpose. There's been massive amounts of training, both in universities around the world as well, and students on multi-parallel programming. And our model is very simple for the many integrated core architecture. Uh, we remain fully committed to what we laid out on stage when I keynoted last year, and that is the same source code run through a, a next generation of compilers will be able to run on multi-core computers with Xeon. It will have more and more cores per socket over time. And we've been through the largest increase of core count over the last several years, from 1 to 2 to 4 to 6 to 8, and now 10 cores in the ZID7 family, could run on many core computers and also take advantage of uh, being able to understand the scalability of cluster architectures as well, uh, multi-core clusters and multi- and many-core clusters. So that enables us infinite flexibility as a CPU supplier 
to drive the marketplace without having to go and continually deliver new tools, new programming languages, et cetera. So we can put more cores into Xeon. We can optimize for the mic architecture in the card form factor. We can put small cores into next generation CPUs. We can put big and small cores into next generation CPUs. And we should make it as transparent as possible to the software community worldwide. And that is a huge positive commitment. And I would say in the last year, it's exceeded our expectations in terms of how the industry has embraced that ease of programming model. You saw some of the quotes in the videos. Um, but I think if you start asking the people who have used the, the mic software development platforms over the last year, you'll say that's probably their number one takeaway is the ease of programming that they've gotten out of this. So basically, we want to democratize highly parallel computing. and. We're encouraging the industry to avoid costly detours down proprietary paths. The other thing we've done in the last year is we've maintained our commitment to Moore's Law. Uh, we announced for the first time in decades a new 3D transistor. People were asking me, how can you continue to shrink and shrink and shrink in a two-dimensional vector? Very simply put, we've now figured out a way to deliver a transistor not just in 2D, but in 3D. So the best analogy I have for you, if you're non-technical, is if you had a piece of land, you can decide to build a one-story farmhouse or a skyscraper. And we're now able now to not just shrink the size of the land and the house, but we now have infinite scalability, again, on Moore's Law to keep it going forward to 22 nanometer, 14 nanometer, and beyond. And we see no more end of life on Moore's Law because of this revolution. Now, I think most people would say on 32, uh, nanometer high K metal gate. We were about three years ahead of the industry. You can decide your own number. Uh, in this space, people are not us, but people are quoting us as even further ahead of the industry. And what that's able to do is, at the same low voltage, deliver 37% performance gain on 32, 22 nanometer versus 32 nanometer, and more than a 50% active power reduction. And that's just the first generation of this uh, 22 uh, nanometer tri gate. A transistor. So this is very foundational to what we've said is every other year we will bring a new process technology to market and every other year we will bring a new processor design to market into the, into the core product line. The other thing we wanted to talk about is just our commitment to exascale with the labs because we can't do this alone. Uh, in Europe we've put together three exascale labs already. Um, I think there'll be more to come in the future, but it's really about delivering strong research partnerships with the industry, with governments around the world, and with universities. And as we look out at Exascale, some of the problems you saw, all those things that we need to do much, much better to get to just the 2x power increase at 100 times the performance, <coughs> we're going to have to deliver better memory stacking technologies, look at silicon photonics, improve security, Obviously, all the work we're doing around parallel programming, uh, interconnect technologies, and uh, you know, breakthroughs in power reduction as well. So all of these things you can begin to see in Intel's efforts in our R&D, in our lab department, where we're looking out not just two to three years, but we're looking out a decade uh, or more. So the biggest thing that's happening this year in the, in the main product line is we'll be in production on the Sandy Ridge product and so many people last year talked about my discussion on Mike in the keynote. A number of people missed what I said about the Sandy Bridge and the core Xeon architecture, which was that Intel's committed to double the growth rate of the floating point in the next several years versus what we have done over the last past several years. So beginning with Sandy Bridge and advanced vector extensions, we get two times the number of theoretical flops We'll have over eight, uh, up to eight cores per socket each um, hyper-threaded core, so 16 threads per socket, uh, double the theoretical floating point, and we're integrating PCI Express onto the processor to deliver even denser designs. And uh, you know, we, we think there'll be incredible new density being delivered uh, as a result of that. So Sandy Bridge on track for production uh, into this year, as we said last year. On Mike, this is a picture of the software development silicon that we had. 
uh, with 32 cores, but we've, we're continuing our commitment of launching a 22 nanometer on the new Trigate uh, transistor that I talked about. So when you look at the kind of power efficiency we've seen, that was new data that will be related to Mike. Uh, more than 50 cores in the product we bring to market. We haven't set an, you know, an exact quarter or anything relative to when we the market, but we have said we're on track for 22 nanometer. Um, and uh, all the programming, programmability benefits we talked about using this familiar development tools, we're still on track uh, with, with the mic architecture. So please let me welcome up Professor Bowden from LRZ to tell you a little bit about what we've done. So our commitment last year was to get a very aggressive software development platform into the marketplace. Um, by the end of this quarter, we'll have 50 end users, large end users, like uh, LRZ here, um, evaluating and driving the architecture. By the end of the year, we'll have 100 um, end users up and running with the architecture with multiple SDVs. So a, a huge commitment of software development this year, getting ready for the products on 22 nanometers. So please. Please allow me to stay here on the table. Uh, this report is on the evaluation of the many integrated <coughs> core architecture done in cooperation between the Leibniz Supercomputing Center and the Technical University of Munich based on prototype chips we got from Intel. Uh, LRZ is hosting the Bavaro German supercomputer of the Gauss Center of Supercomputing and as such is the German contribution to the partnership of advanced computing in Europe and serves European science and industry. In order to always offer the best supercomputers to our customers, we do continuous evaluation of new architectures and programming technologies. As such, we evaluate, of course, accelerator architectures as an alternative to the existing machines we are using today. And we not only evaluate their uh, computational performance, but also their programmability and their energy uh, consumption. And we did all this together with a group of uh, Technical University of Munich. Uh, within uh, the European HPC ecosystem, LRC's supercomputers are the most general purpose. Uh, with about uh, 400 different applications we are running on our machines per year. And this is an interesting testbed, of course, for using uh, the different uh, accelerators. Both TUM and LRZ have many years of reliable and long-term cooperation with Intel. And uh, <coughs> this was the basis for our evaluation with uh, very early versions of the new architecture. The background picture you're seeing here shows an SGI Altix 4700, which is our uh, last HPC system that will run for uh, some uh, more days as we uh, just have uh, uh, taken uh, in uh, uh, the new machine uh, based on Westmere 10 core processors and that offers uh, a solution performance which is uh, slightly above the system you can see there place number uh, 166 uh, on the newest top 500 list and uh, this system will be expanded uh, into uh, the next uh, year's first half where we get a machine with three petaflops uh, power then. Now to sum up again for our users we wanted to evaluate uh, the value of accelerators for a large number of different applications and of course when we use accelerators, we expect very high performance. But we think that programming models are the key to harness the computational power of massively parallel devices in order to not force uh, our users in uh, very important uh, investments into uh, porting codes onto uh, new instruction set architectures. 
Obviously, Intel has realized this trend and substantially supports open standards and invests into innovative programming models. LRZ and TOM are using Intel hard and software for many years uh, and therefore know very well uh, Intel's tool chain as a user for conventional processors. But the interesting thing with the new architecture is that we can use the same tools to optimize the programs uh, for the new target architectures. So what we expect for our users is a hardware product that delivers good performance and energy efficiency as energy costs, especially in Europe and moreover in Germany, are very, very high without losing on programmability for our users. Now let's have a first look on the features of uh, the many integrated core architecture. Well, it is a standard x86 architecture, therefore uh, porting codes is easy. It allows many different parallel programming models like OpenMP, MPI and Intel Silk. It offers the use of standard math libraries like Intel's MKL. And it supports the whole Intel toolchain, for instance compilers, uh, debuggers, performance tools like VTune, uh, the use of emerging data parallel uh, language and languages and libraries, all the PGAS uh, derivatives uh, our users are going to use in the next years, and the use of uh, uh, libraries like uh, the ARIA building blocks uh, from Intel. This sums up to writing mic accelerated core code with minimal effort and great performance for our users. Now let's evaluate performance and programmability with a number of different workloads. We have used three types of benchmarks, which are the Euroben kernels, uh, and applications in the field of data mining, and uh, uh, packet for matrix operations, which can, by the way, uh, seen here as a demo at uh, Intel's booth uh, in uh, uh, the demonstration area. Uh, further on, we continue uh, un other applications like linear algebra and simulation codes in order to support a large number of, of applications that rely on these. But for the first uh, set of benchmarks named here, the Euroband kernels, uh, they represent the seven bars of HPC and they represent features of the main applications uh, we are running uh, on our machines and uh, based on their characteristics. And to sum up, one can say all of these workloads are data parallel uh, workloads and all uh, of these workloads use task parallel uh, application style. Now let's have a look uh, at the numbers. Here you can see uh, the blue and uh, the red line. They are standing for the following. Uh, the blue line is the obtained performance in gigaflops, so uh, the, the maximum is around uh, 100 gigaflops on uh, a single mic uh, architecture with using uh, the classical multi-core programming model without any uh, hand-done optimization. The red line is uh, the performance you obtain after a one, a one and a half hour effort in using uh, the tools offered by Intel uh, in order to optimize the code. And you see uh, there is important uh, better performance uh, going up to nearly 250 gigaflops in the case. And uh, the machine we were using to obtain these figures were uh, a machine uh, based on 30 cores and uh, 10, 50 megahertz uh, version with uh, the offload compiler, single precision and uh, data transfer times are uh, in this case excluded. The next application uh, is the data uh, mining applications with adaptive uh, sparse grids. Uh, this implements a machine learning uh, algorithm. Uh, learning function comes from a training data set and uh, this is an important workload for the classification and regression of huge uh, data sets. 
So once again, the mic execution was straightforward. The first version obtained within a few hours, and the optimized version took about uh, 10 days. So the interesting thing on these uh, two blocks of uh, uh, performances obtained uh, is that this time we compare uh, the mic uh, performance to the performance of a conventional Westmere uh, system, which in this case is a system uh, based on uh, uh, two socket architectures, this means uh, two times uh, six cores. So in this case, uh, the figure obtained after two days, uh, the 420 gigaflops, uh, includes the time for data transfers. This sometimes is a, uh, an important question uh, when you get high numbers in performance of accelerators. Uh, do you speak about the, the mere calculation time uh, within the accelerator or do you also include the time for the data transfer? Here, this includes the data transfer. Now, uh, we have two slides on Tiffany. This is a, a framework for matrix uh, operations optimized on FedEx 86 cores. And it is a self-adaptive and cache obvious framework. And this means that uh, we take into consideration uh, the caches in order to optimize uh, the performance of the matrix operation. And it is uh, implemented by nested recursions and uh, vectorized uh, kernels. So uh, the important thing here is that you can take the, co uh, the code you have on the classical uh, Intel architecture with SSE code and AVX for uh, the vectorizing and you can transfer this directly without difficulties into the MIC code. And the figures you will see on the next page uh, are very impressive. You see the red line uh, indicates the maximum performance obtained, which is uh, in the order of 620 uh, gigaflops. That is uh, more than 50% of the theoretical peak you would obtain with this 32 core engine uh, running at uh, uh, 1200 megahertz. So uh, the precise figure is the maximum was 626 the gigaflops obtained. To sum up, the advantages for our customers in using MIC will be that this relies on a standard x86 instruction set and architecture. It allows many different parallel programming models like OpenMP, MPI and Intelsiv. It also offered the standard libraries like uh, MKL and it supports the whole Intel toolchain uh, including compilers, uh, debuggers and, and other tools. So uh, you have also to keep in mind uh, that all of the optimizing uh, efforts we did were based on uh, tools uh, that were already in a pre-release version. That means once the tools will be further optimized also by Intel, it will even be easier uh, to do this optimizing job. But already with the tools we had our, at our hands, uh, we could obtain 50% of the peak performance. So I can only recommend to visit the demo here at IEC 11. Most of the practical work has been done by Alexander Heineken, who is uh, sitting in the uh, back here and who is running the demo at the Intel booth. Thank you.